Good evening, dandies. Welcome to Undetermined, the podcast. Cool and intelligent and all those things. Cut out the yawning. <laughs> cut, cut out the intelligent. <laughs> right. So we are talking to Mike Moraski. Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks for coming on the show, man. Hi, guys. I've got to admit entirely that I was I was kind of blown away. I was looking up, and you know, we'll we'll sit there and commiserate on who we're gonna you know invite on the show or, or whatnot or, or what kind of guests we'd like to have because it's the only people we talk to are people we want to talk to. And I honestly, I knew you from a steel pole bathtub, right? Mm-hmm. And I think first got turned on to your music is probably that cover you did for uh, Chemical Warfare for Virus 100 for the uh, Dead Kennedys. Yeah. I think it was like 90, 92, 93, somewhere around there. So I was just like, oh, yeah, you know, it'd be cool to get anybody from Steel Pole Bathtub on. Yeah. <laughs> then started looking at your resume and I'm like, oh, wow, he does, uh, he's done a whole bunch of different stuff since then. Yeah. Much more over my head kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm a busy bee, yeah, as it were. Sounds like it, man. You know, I just, I'm a very industrious individual, I guess. I always have been since I was pretty young, I think. I don't know why. I, you know, it's like, you know, the salt of the earth, right? Like, I, I never really understood what that meant until recently. It's like, oh, right. Like, salt makes everything taste better and work actually makes everything better. I know it sounds insane because <laughs> like 90% of the planet, you know, hates its work or is forced to do work they don't want to do or whatever. But if you can find yourself in a situation where you love your work or for that matter, you just do the work you love and, you know, take the consequences either way. I don't know. It, it does. It's like salt in, in everything. Yeah. No, I get that. And there's definitely value and it's, Easier said than done, but if you can find something you love to do, it's worth taking a hit sometimes Yeah, to go that route. You know, I've had jobs that pay better than some other jobs and been way happier at the jobs that paid less. Yeah. And that was worth it to me to make a little bit less to do something that I didn't feel sick every time it was time to go in. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, it's it's easy to say sitting you know, in a situation where I'm not worried about my income currently, you know, but I have been for decades, really, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. pretty much the entire steel pole career. I mean, we were on tour constantly, so we were able to pay our rent and not have to work too much when we were home, you know, but uh, there were, we we're still making what, $17,000 a year, right. whatever the, the poverty line was, you know, and right. I wouldn't trade that for anything. And in the period before that was even more dire, really. I remember when I was the only one with a job for a while. And uh, this is early before Dorothy joined the band uh-huh. and we were in Colorado and and when I get paid, we'd all like walk to Safeway, the three of us, and, you know, buy a bag of potatoes, oh, yeah. a loaf of bread. And like, because it was my money, I was the one who got the red hot fireball, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> we'd all eat the bread uh, walking back to our house. Right. And then when we get back to the house, bake the potatoes. But, you know, I don't know. Like, those were good times. Right. Yeah. Ooh, look who's. Buying off the middle shelf this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, I had a similar story. I talked about it out here before, singing the praises of living on baked potatoes. Oh, man. That was a perfect meal, you know, a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, we would bake the whole bag. Then you could easily, like, pull one out and fry it or pull it out and, you know, like, it made it a really quick meal. There you go. If, if you're all pre-baked, I guess. Huh. Yeah. Protein in there. And- Vitamins, mm-hmm. minerals, all but, sorts uh, of good stuff. I got skinny um, on potatoes, though. Man, did I get skinny on potatoes. <laughs> Nobody yeah. ever got fat eating just potatoes, I'll tell you uh, that. I was definitely, I mean, yeah, I was definitely very thin back then. Yeah, uh, stealing condiments from, you know, fast food places. Yeah, <laughs> yep. yep. Ketchup soup, you know. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I've, I've, yeah, I've done every version, every version. But mm. you know, and ramen used to be twenty five cents too, which was oh yeah, it's thing. still pretty cheap. 
Yeah. Fairly yeah. cheap. I've seen it for like a buck though. I was just, you know, just trying to pass yeah. that off. Like eh, everything's a dollar. You can afford a dollar. It's like, yeah. well, not really. I mean, that could have been, yeah. <laughs> but of course, you lines. know, it's, it's fun to, to nostalgize that, but obviously there are people hurting right now too. Oh yeah. You know, I'd hate to hate to downplay that in by any stretch because there's a certain amount of privilege that goes with being able to choose to be poor. Right. You know? Um Yeah. Mine was self inflicted. Yeah. Right. You know, it's funny though, I do think about it in, you know, this the starving artist kind of, you know, mythos is to me it's sort of like it took me it took me a while to figure it out. But for one thing, like when you're hungry, like creating is really like really satisfying. Like it's, if it's the only, like if you're in an apartment or wherever you happen to be living, Mm -hmm. you're starving, you don't have any money. You can't go do anything. If you have a means to create, it's a really kind of encompassing way to escape all of the things, right? Yeah. You're bored, you're alone in the world, you're hungry, whatever. It kind of gives you a certain kind of satisfaction. But the other thing that, that, that occurred to me much later is that you know, if you're going to be a lawyer or a doctor, you're going to go do what a 10 years of schooling, you know, and so on. And those are the dues you pay, right. <clears throat> to become one of those professions. Right. Whereas art is sort of like, you have to pay this other due that just is ill-defined. In fact, it's yeah. almost utterly undefined, you know, right. Um, other than learning your craft, quote unquote, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think uh, being more satiated you know, as you've established a career and everything else like that, does that affect the the payoff for you? I mean, when you uh, create something or has that never changed for you? Yeah. I, you know, it's a really good question. I, I have a kind of a, an answer that's just slightly askew from that. Uh-huh. The thing for me is that pretty much, and I can, I can still, it's still an experiment I can run. Um, if I, if I stop working for, let's say two weeks, I think it starts right around two weeks and is, pretty full throttle by three, Uh like there's a machine in my head that just turns on and it just starts spinning. And all of a sudden I'm like, Oh, I'm going to have to write an opera and then I'm going to have to, you know, (laughs) write this Uh record and then I'm going to join this band. And it just, it just is this fucking like treadmill is just just grinding. And, uh, and it was, it's kind of the thing that drove me all through my life until I had, I got a proper, like, creative job Uh like where i go to work and i do a job that's creative and it just turned it off it was fucking amazing actually like wow and it's so funny because i remember when the band stopped you know we never really quit we just kind of became disinterested in continuing and it became too difficult to sort of put it all together together you know Uh but uh so many people are like, why, like you had the dream gig. Like, why would you stop doing that? And I was like, oh man, I just want to go to a job every day and yeah. you know, <laughs> and see the same people and sort of be able to pursue some other things that you can't do in a van, for example, you know? Sure. Right. And so then this weird byproduct of sort of discovering that working in creative fields just totally calmed the beast, you know, which is not necessarily always a good, um, yeah. I do, I do miss that, that aspect of it, but it's kind of been replaced with this other thing where, you know, I work with, I mean, just today I was, you know, I'm, I'm working in games now and I was on a, in a meeting yeah. and I was kind of zoom is nice. You can kind of listen in and then turn your video on and chime in and then turn it back off and listen. And right. It was the craziest fucking shit you've ever heard. You know, it's like, <laughs> we're going to create this creature and it's going to do this thing and it's creating this goo that, you know, and it's just fucking nutso. Right. And I, <laughs> I was just sitting there listening. And meanwhile, I was like working on some music on this, you know, at the same time. And, you know, it was like, okay, this is just bizarre that this is actually <laughs> a job. A job. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, right. Like, yeah. Do those things ever like feed on each other? Like the music inspires the, you know, other graphic work or whatever, or vice versa? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, there's a, a bunch of examples of that from previous games for sure. Um, in fact, the last one we just released is this VR game called Half-Life Alex. Yeah. There was, you know, I was aware from other previous games that if we're paying attention as a as a group, I can kind of say, hey, like maybe we'll make this sound musical and then we can use it as sort of a meter to to sort of drive the, uh, how do you put it, like the, the kind of tempo. Tempo is not quite the right 
word, but sort of the uh, pulse mm. of this section. Right. Because games are a little different. You, you do the same thing in film. Like it's incredible in film. If, if you have a piece of dialogue, that's kind of hard to understand. Yeah. And, and that can be, it can be an actor's fault or an editor's fault or whatever, or maybe it's delivered really quickly, or maybe it's complex dialogue, whatever. Uh -huh. But if you just put like a click track behind it, all of a sudden it becomes infinitely easier to understand huh. the human brain just loves to have a pulse to kind of meter shit out to, you know? Huh. Um, anyway, long story short in games, you have these huge sections where, you know, it could take two hours to do something and yet the whole time you're supposed to be pursuing this quest that is this one thing. So, right. you know, any ways that we can come up with to sort of drive the player towards or, or remind the player that they have this long-term quest while they do these sh shorter term quests anyway. So yeah, I, I kind of try and get those things in there when I can. And, and to your earlier question, I've been really super fortunate in most of my work that I can find some art in the craft, yeah. you know, cause most multimedia uh, ventures are a product, right? Right. Cause they cost a shit ton of money to make and therefore they have to make a shit ton of money to, to kind of break even and, and net profit. Right. And so that's usually the driving factor, but I get to generally speaking, I've gotten to work with people doing pretty big things and taking big swings at, at concepts and art projects. And so I've gotten to, turn the art knob up pretty high on occasion. Um, so yeah, it's pretty satisfying. I have to say. Yeah, that would be. And I, I think I'm a big believer that really anything has an art to it. If you invest in it enough. Yeah. You know, you can be an artistic accountant, right? You talk to them, somebody that really knows their stuff and is really kind of passionate about it. And I know that's a weird example, but I, I think that makes it a good example. They can make it fascinating if they're like really explaining, okay, this is how this works. Oh my God, oh. I never thought of it that way, right? And these different perspectives that they have because they've invested so much in it and it really does become an art in itself. Yeah. So I think that's what a lot of art is, is finding that perspective that not everybody is able to see. Right. I agree. Yeah. And and Matt Matt really likes his accountant too. So <laughs> <laughs> if I could afford an accountant, <laughs> right? You think I could get an original piece? You know, <laughs> here's your return. Right. Ooh, I'm going to frame cool. this. Thank you, man. Did you sign that? <laughs> But yeah, but how did that, uh, so when was the big uh, uh, break then going out of music, you know, playing music in Bozeman, Montana? Oh, uh, yeah, that's way back when. Way back. And then you moved, what was the first uh, uh, kind of straight job? You mean after, you mean after the band? After the band. Yeah, yeah. after the band. <laughs> um, you know, I. it's funny, I had, I worked during the band briefly in the early days, we just, we all had to work and, you know, cause we were just getting going. And, um, you know, luckily we had bulging eye as our booking agency really early on. That was Michelle Vlasimsky, who was Wayne Coyne's girlfriend. And so, okay. um, you know, and she, she was booking everybody right then at that, yeah. you know, in, in, in retrospect, none of this back then it was nothing, you know, even the flaming lips were like, okay, well they did rel relatively well on college radio, but uh -huh. you know, you're still playing in clubs to what 75 people, maybe 150 on, on occasion, whatever. Right. But you know, all of the upcoming Seattle bands were going straight to her. And so, um, we were touring pretty heavily right out the gate, but you know, we just weren't bringing in the dough that, you know, it's it, even back then it's still San Francisco. It wasn't cheap, right? but so we all had jobs, but you know, I had this, uh, gig for a while working on mixing consoles there's a mixing console called the euphonics which uh was the first digital desktop uh -huh. you know so that all the knobs and faders are just digital pots that are creating numbers that then go and control a analog uh, mainframe mm -hmm. and it was totally the first of its kind uh -huh. and now is owned by avid i think and you know it's it's purely digital at this point of course yeah so I did that for a little bit. That wasn't really creative, but it was really hands heavy in studio recording and yeah, and all of that stuff. But through that, I whenever we were on tour, I kind of read every fiction book I could get my hands on, and so I started getting into reading like computer manuals. <laughs> which I know <laughs> sounds super boring. Oh yeah, but uh, you know it was just like you know you spend so many hours in the van that you got to find you know some way to 
I don't know, keep yourself interested. And right. and I got into computer animation in uh, the early 90s, which I know now it's like you, there's whole institutes for it. Sure. Little kids can, you know, animate computer graphics and, yeah. and all that. But, mm-hmm. but back then it was kind of like I go on AOL and download a crack of some yeah. <laughs> piece of software and, you know, kind of taught myself how. And I don't know if you remember uh, Liquid Television. Yeah. Yeah. I love looking at television. Yeah. yeah. That was, that was all done by Colossal Pictures, which is a, was a studio in San Francisco and, and, you know, basically employed a huge portion of our art community. You know, a lot of the same people that would come to our shows um, or we'd hang out with at the bar or at parties, they were all, you know, working at Colossal making liquid television. Huh. And one of the producers, an old friend, came by for dinner and I was still kind of working on this animation. This is probably 1993 or four or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and she saw what I was doing was like, Holy shit. Do you want a job? Like we oh, would wow. totally hire wow. you to do this. And I was like, fuck no. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm a, I'm in a band and B like, I love doing this. Why would I want a job doing this? That would ruin it. Oh Yeah. And then fast forward to like 96, you know, somewhere in there, I think we had, I I remember pretty clearly we'd been on tour and ended up with like two days off in Hawaii and we're just in hell. Like, (laughs) like I was like, Oh cool. Can I go surf or whatever? But in general, as a band, not doing well, we just didn't, we weren't healthy as a, as a group anymore. Yeah, I mean, we'd been on tour for eight months or, or something like that, you know? And, uh, so I got home and then I was like, well, fuck, what am I going to do? Like, we're not, it was kind of before we started on listenable, but I could feel that that was going to be, is going to be a while and we weren't going to tour. So there wouldn't be any money coming in. We, you know, we were not, you know, we're on a major label at that point. So no pumping out a single to pay the rent or whatever. Right. And so I called up my friend, Ann, this producer, uh-huh. and I was like, hey, about that job. And so <laughs> yeah. she ended up hiring me into uh, this company called Protozoa, which was, you know, Colossal Pictures, which was Liquid Television, branched off into three three companies, um, Protozoa, Monkey Brain, oh. and uh, Wild Brain. That was the one I'm trying to Wild think Brain. of. And then there was one more, too. Anyway, so I worked there for a few years, and... Uh, it was great. It was like kind of really underground. In fact, I have some, you know, I worked as an animator and as an animation director and a director for a while. Mm-hmm. I have some pieces that I did right before I left for Lord of the Rings with this great comedian who I'm not going to remember his name off right off the top of my head. I'd have to go look it up, but fantastic. Like just total mm-hmm. like Looney Tunes off the charts improv guy. And it's really kind of dark and weird. Like it was very underground, you know, the things right. we were doing were, were like that. And so um, a, a friend of mine who had worked there, you know, this is sort of how, how everything works. I think um, in the real world is, you know, you make friends and allies with people that you get along with. And, and so this younger guy, Bay rate, who was, you know, Bonnie rates nephew, he, he kind of comes from, uh, LA royalty ultimately, but just this really talented guy. Uh-huh. And he was younger at the time. He went to New Zealand to work on Lord of the Rings and uh-huh. he called me up and he, he was like, Hey, Hey, you're not going to believe this project down here. It's fucking nuts. It's going to be amazing. Do you want to come? And I was like, no, dragons <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was just like, I don't think so. I'm working on underground shit, man. This stuff's great. Yeah. And then, um, uh, few things happened in my personal life that um, kind of made me feel like I wanted to leave town. So I signed up and went down there. And then that turned out to be obviously an amazing project to work on. Now, what was it again? Yeah. Lord of something? Or something oh, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I would have thought Peter Jackson would have given enough, uh, you know, street cred, though, for all his horror yeah. work and stuff. Yeah. That probably helped a little bit, didn't it? It did. It was mostly just that, I mean, I loved Lord of the Rings. I read the book like five times as a kid. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I, I'm from the 70s. I'm a 70s, you know, kid. So, yeah, all that stuff really spoke to me. But, you know, and you're, you know, later on, it was kind of, I was working on quote unquote underground stuff. And so I kind of wanted right. to stick there. But it, it worked out because the company I was working for ended up folding. And I was in New Zealand having a blast. Cool. You know, and 
Yeah. And Peter Jackson's amazing to work with. In fact, yeah, everybody I worked with on that. So, well, not everybody. Right. <laughs> you know, well, a lot that's of people. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but a lot of the, the key people I worked with were pretty incredible. Well, for as mainstream as he is, I think Peter Jackson does still maintain a little bit of an underground feel to him, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. You know, it's interesting. His animation director, uh, this friend of mine, Randy, um, is was, you know, a little bit older, um, but really studied under Harryhausen, Ray Harryhausen. Oh, yeah, really? Um, yeah. And so they really purposely, because they knew they were going to use a ton of CG, mm-hmm. so they purposely brought him in and he really pushed that sort of stop motion feel just to kind of, you know, to trick the audience to get over the uncanny Valley hump, you know? Yeah. yeah. So that, uh-huh. um, I mean, there's still some pretty rough edges on that, those films, but um, I think they hold up largely because of that vocabulary that we were using, which was kind of like, remember this is still art. And so there's that. And, and also mm-hmm. like that there, there was this, it's hard to say in words, but you know, it, a, it was just this insane project, like three films in an insanely short period of time mm-hmm. and kind of one of those projects that are like the matrix sequels were similar where it was just like, Oh no, this is impossible. Right. It's like, Oh, well, okay. You're hired. You know, it's like, no, no, <laughs> didn't, didn't you hear me? Like, this, <laughs> what you want to do is not possible. Yeah. And so there was kind of this hectic, chaotic energy, you know, and I'm a huge believer. I've always uh, on the steel pole records, everything. Like if I was playing or singing or whatever, I really had a, always had a very clear mind about what the, the emotional intent of the piece was. And so while I'm playing it, I was hmm. embodying that. It's like acting, I guess, you know, but sure. Um, or like no plays, you know, where there are, yeah those Japanese plays where they're just covered in, in, you know, um, costumes and makeup. And, and the whole point there is that they have to communicate these emotions through the deepest barriers possible. Right. 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 And so it's kind of this like direct, I know, you know, I hate to use new age terms or whatever, but kind of, you know, soul energy. (laughs) It's almost (laughs) like maybe puppeteering would be a good example. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and it makes sense yeah. too. If you embody all those super fine kind of chaos theory levels of detail will tend to align around those types of feelings, right? The, the kind that you can't measure or you can, but it, it, you know, chaos, it would be take a super duper complex um, analysis to find those details, you know? Yeah. Those films everybody working on them, it felt like this weird chaos because it was just so over the top, like beyond, like everybody was reaching so beyond, you know, the maximum threshold of possibility. Mm -hmm. And so it was just like madness. There was kind of this madness kind of going on in the crew. And uh, I think you can feel it in the pictures, you know, it's kind of got this and Peter Jackson's direction 10, you know, he does those Dutch angles and, and all that kind of kind of quirky camera work mm-hmm. that I think, I don't know. I think it all really worked together. It did. Yeah. You know, to make a weird, like a cool, weird version of those stories that I think is definitely yeah. standing the test of time for sure. Yeah. I think you did all right. <laughs> yeah. <it turned laughs> out okay. Of course. Yeah. You're not okay. Yeah. No, Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm monster town. It's just great work. I can't imagine being in charge of something like that. Like it's such a huge project. Like it, seriously, it's almost a movie just watching the credits. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. And you know, um, because I was, you know, in charge of this group that I was working with and in various aspects, I worked in a bunch of different um, components just because of some of the experiences I'd had previous were different. You know, I was the only one who had worked with motion capture, for example, Mm -hmm. um, as as extensively as I had. And so I had all these, I'd go into these meetings with him, you know, I still have just giant books of storyboards and, you know, shot scene breakdowns, that kind of thing. And I'd go in with this list of like, okay, we're going to talk about 60 shots. And we're talking about, he was working on three films with, you know, just thousands of shots, right? Like all at the same time. 
And I'd go in with my list and I would just, you know, I'd say, okay, you know, shot this, da, da, da. And, and he'd go like, oh yeah, that's this. I mean, no reference, nothing. Just like off the top of his head, wow. he'd know exactly what shot I'm talking about, exactly what his intent was for that shot. He was really remarkable. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll never forget that. Like pretty much every time I went and worked with him, every now and again, he'd pull up like a clamshell, meaning, you know, those old video playback devices uh, Yeah. and say like, here's what I want, you know, like, mm -hmm. so um, just cause it was easier for him to show me if they had, if they'd mocked it up in advance, done some previous, huh. but uh, I mean, all the, all the directors I've worked with for the most part have been pretty amazing people. Luckily, you know, for me, yeah, some producers are maybe not so much, <laughs> but right. you know, that's their job too. So I saw a lot of awards for like a lot of uh, speaking of chaos, uh, just a lot of like swarm scenes and, uh, you know, in, in the matrix trilogies and in Lord of the Rings were like the, you know, the massive crowd scenes or, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So was that primarily your work then? I mean, did you work with those engines and rendering or I did? Yeah. Yeah, I was a member of that team uh -huh. and, you know, basically took, you know, so if you think about there's the guy who wrote Massive. And so he was really in charge of that team. And then he had a right hand, um, John Allett, who was really took over how the rendering functioned because we had to create our own rendering pipeline just because we were rendering so, you know, so many assets. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I don't want to go off into the CG woods weeds, okay, weeds yeah, I mean, <laughs> maybe the yeah. cg weed but uh, not the cg weeds <laughs> right. and then you know basically like it, it was me and a, and a couple other people directly under them taking chunks of of you know concepts and things that needed to happen as well as just scenes and and shots uh, at the end of the day and like i said i because i had done a lot of mocap direction Earlier on, I ended up working directly with the animation department and worked with the, all the, the stunt people to design all the weapon-based, weapon, locomotion, all the different sort of motion behaviors of all the different species, which was fascinating. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, so the, like, I worked with the sword master. Nice. So, <laughs> right on. And kind of design these game-like trees of motions and then go and uh, capture them, you know, with with stunt actors and whatnot. And then I also did pretty much all the CG, basically B-roll motion capture with the fellowship. So, you know, I worked with Ian McKellen and Vigo Mortensen and, you know, all, all of that crew. Oh, wow. Which was really funny. Like, it was not, I didn't see it, you know, literally, I went to work one day and uh, Randy, you know, called me and he was like, hey, you know, <laughs> uh -huh. um, yeah, Sean Aston's Sean Aston's at the mocap stage. Um, <laughs> here's a list of shots. Go, go, go capture. <laughs> I was like, wait, Sh Sean uh -huh. Aston? You mean the actor? Sean Aston's there? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. The Goonie? Yeah. What? <laughs> wow. So yeah, there's, there's some funny stories there too. Vigo didn't want to do it, you know? No, he didn't. <laughs> he, thought, he thought we were going to be capturing like his soul and that we'd be able to make taco commercials with his motion. <laughs> oh yeah. That's not a bad idea. I know. He should have brought it up. <laughs> um, but I convinced and which I'd known that he was married to Exine Cervenka at the time. I because we totally, you know, I don't know, you click with some people and I really got along with him immediately <laughs> um, and was able to convince him to do the work that needed to get done. But later I learned that he had been married to Exine for a long time and and they had a kid together and I was like, Oh man, that would have been such a like good thing to have known yeah. going into that conversation. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So there's some, some Lord of the Rings nostalgia for me. It's That's... nostalgia anyway. <laughs> sure. Sure. It sounds like it was a pretty awesome experience. Yeah. Or I can't imagine after doing something like that, does it ever, do other projects just seem almost like a letdown? I'm sure matrix kind of be an exception to that rule. Yeah, but like other things, just like oh my gosh, yeah, this isn't quite as uh, I don't know. Well, I guess I've done a pretty good job of you know leapfrogging to other things that continue to be interesting to me, mm -hmm. and I think a lot, you know, again, it's a lot of it's luck, a lot of it's just meeting the right 
people while you work and becoming friends and uh, like ally is almost a better term. Like, like, you know, the whole, it's who, you know, thing. Yeah. In my opinion, it, it really just isn't that at all. It's, it's who, you know, that trusts you, you know? Yeah. And cause there's a lot of people that are really untrustworthy in this world yeah. and they exist in, in the arts just as much as they do anywhere else. And so if you, you know, do good work and can deliver kind of what you promise and, and are trustworthy, then, you know, people trust you and they're really going to want to hire you because no one wants to hire someone they can't trust, (laughs) you know? Right. Right. Well, it's a big investment, you know, in these sorts of projects, both financially, emotionally, time-wise, you want to know that it's somebody that you can really trust. Fuck yeah. I mean, both those sets of films were multiple years of my life, every, everyone's lives, you know? And so yeah. you're kind of committing that much time to something and video games are even longer, you know, they're somewhere in the two to five year range, depending, you know? And so, mm, yeah, you know, it's, you kind of want to know that you're, you're getting into it with people that are going to, you know, you're going to end up with these products that you're proud of, you know? Um, I did do a, a phase for a while where, you know, I worked on some Spider-Man films and I don't know, Superman and uh, Catwoman, you know, mm-hmm. it's kind of this, like I said, salt, you know, I was working, yeah. I was just kind of exercising the muscles and, right. and that's all fine. But, uh, but in that process, I also uh, hooked up with an old friend from the Matrix films who was, uh, oh my God. Okay. So he was married to Bjork forever. Um, Matthew Barney. He had he had signed up with Matthew Barney, who's this really well known to some people's tastes, to other people's not so much. But he's a fine artist, does you know giant um, museum pieces. But mm-hmm. his main thing is that he made these films that are a piece of art. Like you can't see them unless you own one. Oh wow! <clears throat> they come in this, this whole thing, and and they're pretty amazing pieces of, of film work. You know, really big productions with lots of kind of special effects, but purely art, like just crazy, crazy uh, deep art. And so he was doing this film. It wasn't a Cree master film. It was um, drawing restraint nine. And so I worked with this guy, Matt Wallen, mm-hmm. who was this, the, the effect supervisor on that for like, I, it was almost, a, I probably six months to a year, somewhere in that ballpark. And mm-hmm that was another one that was just weird, like a weird, like, Oh yeah, I guess I'll go do this for a while. And it was like, Holy shit, Matthew Barney's mate. This is project is totally nuts. Yeah. Like I remember, you know, asking, I had this scene that I needed to create some CG elements for. And I was like, dude, like I can do it like this. I could do it like that. Like what, you know, how do you want this to look? And he, he said, hold on a second. And he like pulled out his, I guess there weren't more, it wasn't phones. It was probably an iPod or something. Mm-hmm. He just played this piece of music for me. That was just like, <laughs> <laughs> he was like, right? I want it to look like that. <laughs> I <was> like, <laughs> All right. All right. Fair enough. All right. You got the right guy. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, so I've been super lucky. Yeah. You know, and then Valve is just this fantastic company to work for. And so, you know, it's just, um, you know, I can't, I can't complain for sure. Yeah. You've been with them, what, uh, like 15 years, something like that? Yes. Oh, it's 16, I think now. Yeah. Something like that. I, you know, I kind of, I worked for them as a freelance contractor at first, and then it kind of took a little convincing to get them to consider hiring me to do music, but yeah, it ended up working out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I like, you know, it's, I guess that 16 years is testament to what a good gig it is and how much I love working with everybody I work with, you know, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like they've got a cool, uh, just company structure over there and yeah. I mean, you don't have bosses. Is that right? Yeah. It's pretty unique. It's, you know, I think, I think that sort of structure has become a little bit of a, a joke and other, you know what I mean? It's kind of, you know, like, 
you know, it's like, oh yeah, you get, uh, I don't know, a Hawaiian shirt Fridays or whatever. <laughs> sure do. <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. Playing, playing ping pong in the lobby. And, right. Yeah. But you have to work 120 hour weeks or whatever, <laughs> you know? And so it's kind of, it's hard to, to really lean into it as much as I would have once upon a time, just verbally, you know? Right. But the way it works there is pretty great. You know, there are, you know, it's trade-offs like, you know, all power there is implicit. You know, the idea that there's no power would be ridiculous. Of course there's power, right? but it's kind of this weird merit-based trust-based thing where you deliver something and do a good job, you get more trust and, you know, trust is your power. Again, there's that trust thing, you know? Right. That sounds almost humane. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It, it, it generally speaking is, but for people who would prefer an explicit structure and kind of have a hard time not knowing what to do or where they stand or that kind of thing, it's really hard. Yeah. And I, and I think it's fair to acknowledge that it can be really hard, a hard place for some types of people to work. Right. It can be too chaotic almost for some people. Sure. Exactly. Whereas someone, you know, a feral person like myself, um, it's perfect, you know. Right. I like it all over the place, you know, and I think kind of John does too. Uh, you know, look at what we even call ourselves. We're undetermined. We don't know where the fuck we're going to go <laughs> from one episode to another, you know, from one topic to another. No I mean, idea. Literally, I don't know what we're going to be talking about two minutes from now. <laughs> I know we're not even really talking about music, which is kind of great, actually. You know, all oh, that sucks. I was going to ask a question about that, but. <laughs> 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 no, do you have, one thing I, and this is kind of a random thought that popped into my head while we were talking do you ever see like films and, and shit that every now you'll just see like a scene or just how something was done and it makes you cringe oh yeah it's it's terrible although it's gotten so pat like the the quality of effects has gotten so easy to accomplish that mm. you know it's it's pretty it's pretty remarkable how seldom that actually happens, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't tend to watch films that are going to lean that direction, you know, I think at this point. Right. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's the sausage problem, right? Like, I know how it's made. <laughs> right. And so... I have to kind of make a point to lose myself to the film. Right. Just like anybody else would, you know, especially, you know, we just saw um, with my, my youngest, we went and saw Black Widow. Yeah. Right. So it's one of those films that the only point is to lose yourself to the ride. Yeah. You know, like it's, you know, the others, Marvel's pretty good at sneaking in some, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of higher minded ideas and ideals from time to time. But for the most part, it's just a big ride, you know? And there I am like going, Hmm, that sound, you know, that score is kind of interesting or, you know, Oh, that doesn't really live up to, you know, whatever. And it's all of a sudden there, I'm just going, what the fuck? Like, who cares? You know? Right. No, I do. Too, and I'm not anywhere near your level, but there are times I'll tell you an example that just recently was watching, you know, the Star Wars again. And of course, Lucas had to go back in and fuck up a bunch of shit. <laughs> but I, when Han Solo steps on Jabba's tail, it makes me crazy every time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just like, just don't even acknowledge, just forget the tail was there and just let him walk behind him. It's, you're just pointing out the problem. Yeah. Because it is clunky, <laughs> clunky, clunky. Yes, it yeah. is. But you know, those films, I mean, this is sticky water that I know from the internet. I know better <laughs> to go treading in these waters. Right. All of those films have some real tongue in cheek, ham fisted humor that's pretty terrible. You know, Mm -hmm. like, right. And that's kind of part of the charm, I guess, you know, it's hard now, but when we were kids, you know, I remember going to star Wars, the first star Wars in the movie theater and just, you know, it rocked my world. And I think part of it is that there was that kind of almost childlike humor. Yeah. You know, kind of made it safe. Yeah. I remind people all the time that, you know, it's like, you know, the first film that you all regard as canon before it was ever edited, had this line in it laugh it up fuzzball right <laughs> it's like it, it was there it wasn't as serious and you know what intense as it was you know as we like kind of deify it these days or it was campy yeah. yeah very campy is a good word 
Clinton yeah. camp. Yeah. You may, you know, the, that little truck robot that, you know, comes upon, yeah. you know, upon Chewbacca and is like, Oh, and turns around and exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. off, you know, it's, you know, and, and that's the thing is like, again, it's like against the modern world where, you know, you're going to, they're going to behead the main hero in the third episode of, you know, <laughs> whatever. Right. Um, it seems pretty ham fisted, but it, the thing about it and, you know, all those sort of um, like E.T., those the films of that era, uh, they really welcome children in, you know, they sure do. Yeah. Which is is important because Star Wars is scary. Sure. Really. If you th- if you think about being, you know, young. Oh, yeah. And so having some kind of welcoming, you know, humor to it. I think is important. I mean, again, see here, I'm just wading into like all kinds of, <laughs> no matter how you, which, <laughs> which, which way you lean on this, I'm sure. Oh you know, yeah. I think you finessed it pretty well. Yeah. I think you're fine. <laughs> diplomatically. There yeah. You Thank you. Extremely yeah. diplomatically. I would say. <laughs> Meanwhile, I am, I am appreciative of the, the slightly more adult humor that Marvel brings to their pictures, you know, but there, it's still sort of, it's kind of still kids are just that much more savvy too. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I used to appreciate that. Like about the Muppets. Oh yeah. Like I'd watch them as a kid and I loved them. I went back and watched them as an adult. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is hilarious on a whole different level. This is great. (laughs) Totally. Oh man. Excellent musical guests every week. Um, Totally. And the guys who've been on that show. Yeah. We, we streamed it all uh, like every episode here during the pandemic. (laughs) It came out on HBO or something. That's great. You know, here's a pretty good brag, actually. Now, I mean, I know that is, I'm, you know, we're it's a podcast and we're interviewing me, so <laughs> it's it's pretty easy to just blah 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 about myself. But this one, I think, is pretty cool. Uh-huh. When I very first hooked up with my wife, she was a, a producer at this company, Protozoa, that I worked at, mm-hmm. and we were doing kind of this real time uh, motion capture stuff, and puppeteering was was part of that, right? And so one of my colleagues designed the the system for you ever see elmo have you watched elmo yeah yeah uh-huh. right you know when he th- there's the the drawer that pulls out and is kind of cg and it's it's a, like crayon drawn drawer that the the desk kind of the drawers come out and then like the the window shade goes up and in elmo's world yeah yeah yeah, yeah. The, mm-hmm. those things are all digital models that are puppeteered in real time with these sponge based things that have sensors on them <laughs> so we had like you know, Ses- yeah, we're not Sesame Street. Well, yeah, Sesame Street puppeteers using these things yeah. and animate, you know, real time puppeteering this CG animation. So I got to go on set and watch, you know, Elmo be being shot, Elmo's world. And it was just fantastic. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was such a, a dream. That's a trip. Yeah. Huh. And so I, I didn't design that stuff, but I did design some of the technology that was used for it. So. Oh, I see. Yeah. awesome. That was, that was kind of cool. Huh. I mean, see, that what a weird thing though, to be reminded, I had completely forgotten about that. Huh. You know, Kevin clash, you know, he's just like this huge dude. And then he's like, blah, 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 yeah. Blah, blah, yeah. Blah. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's a little more voice. Thing, huh? Yeah. Yep. Yep. He got in a little bit of trouble. Oh yeah. That's right. I guess he did. Didn't he? Did he? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hear it. You don't. We won't go into that. No. Don't ruin Elmo for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Speaking of that, we've got, hopefully, John, you've been talking to Meats. Yeah, Meats Meyer. Uh, he's out of L.A., right? Uh, worked with uh, Tool, Pussifer. Right. Did a lot of their work, uh, digital artwork, and stuff like that. He's supposed to be coming on the show. Oh, great. Oh, his stuff is so good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Beautiful work. Yeah. But yeah, he uh, apparently he just messaged me and was like, uh, he's like, yeah, I mean, I've got something coming up. It's it's uh, going to be busy for a little bit. So I had to postpone it. And, and it turned out it was like the, working on that whole uh, Pussifer video <laughs> thing was what's going on. So I was like, well, it's like, you have been busy. Yeah. Yeah. I, li- I like them. They're, yeah. This stuff's good. Yeah. Well, I don't know about you guys, but post COVID was really has been tricky. Like, I think I'm adapted now, but for a while I was just overwhelmed by everything, you know, it was like, Mm, yeah. Every, all of a sudden everybody's like, yeah, okay. Now that things are back to normal, can we, you know, it's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. (laughs) No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Yeah. Easing back in has been a little bit weird. And then now everything is going backwards again. So I know makes me kind of happy. I didn't like fully embrace. Okay. We're free. Yeah. (laughs) 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's a whole topic. We'll we'll skip that one, but yeah. still, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, shit. I mean, it should be normalized to talk about it, but it certainly sucked. It's it could suck again. I hope it doesn't. The company that I, the masks that I like, I kind of have this. I don't know about you guys, but I ended up with like four different masks. There's like the the light mask that I can breathe through, and then uh-huh. there's the heavy duty one for you know going to the the grocery store or whatever. Right. And that company is they're actually called Stark, and they're from Oregon. They make vacuum cleaners normally, but they pivoted to making masks huh. and they just sent out this thing saying like half, half off. And I like bought four masks immediately. <laughs> yeah. I was like, uh. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to have those in my back pocket. Just, you know, just in case. Well, and you know, we live in California and so, you know, it's like, Oh, we have this window of respite, I guess is the right way to say it. But you know, a few months between, COVID quote unquote ending. And then, you know, the inevitable fucking firestorms that are going to be here yep, right. that are already in some places, but you know, we're in Northern California. So yeah, fingers crossed. Hopefully it'll be a while. But. Yeah. We're in Missouri. It is not great here. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh yeah. You guys are, you, aren't you like number one, I think. Yeah. We were leading. I don't know. I, think so. I don't know. Florida may have taken us recently. <laughs> number one. <laughs> Number yeah. one, <laughs> number that's one, right. and spreading the Delta variant. Yeah, I think that's us. Well, Cal- California is always quick on your heels. I mean, we're we're just terrible. I don't, I, I guess it's yeah. You know, it's it's there's other parts of California. We had that that methamphetamine rivalry for a long time too. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> between the two states. Oh my God! <laughs> number one, no, California is. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm trying to remember, uh, Missouri may be one of the few states that we didn't play as a band. I'm not positive. I think we may have played one small bar. Like there's like, you know, Arkansas, Missouri, Mississippi. I mean, I just listed the three COVID states, right? But right. those were the ones <laughs> I think that we either didn't play or we just played one. T- you know, there was somebody had a bar briefly where they were doing shows and then, you know. Because most, we pray pretty much every other state, but um, not Alaska. We never made it up there for some reason. Yeah. No, I never caught you here. I don't think I ever caught you here. Yeah. Well, you have to make up for that someday when there's a big reunion. We'll we'll find a place. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Uh, we'll see about that. <laughs> it would be it would be great but it's always i don't know it's uh we the three of us are always you know on a text thread together and so we get offers from time to time i think what it comes down to is every time we get an offer we talk about it and then it kind of comes down to well i guess we're all kind of different people so do we really want to go play that music like that's not the music we would make right now so do we want to go play it right i think i'm starting to shift my mentality more towards yeah fuck it let's just do it and (laughs) like just pretend (laughs) like we could just pretend that this is the music we would make you know it's a show yeah exactly it's it's an it's a show yeah is there anything you're into right now musically oh geez um you know i just I just heard some coil that I really liked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, kind of chippy choppy um, digital stuff. Industrial stuff, yeah. Yeah, where it was really working for me. You know, I I listened to an ungodly amount of soundtrack music. Huh. You know, which is is just it was kind of one of the cool um, fringe benefits of of shifting into being a com- you know quote unquote composer is all of a sudden there was this huge wealth of music that. I had never really like mined, you know, I feel like I'd kind of, you know, at that point had mined a lot of what was out there in terms of, you know, rock and pop and all the thing, you know, avant-garde and all the things that we would normally be listening to. And all of a sudden, and, you know, and the obvious like Henry Mancini and Morricone, like these right. are still some of my very favorite composers, you know, film composers. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden it was like, God, there's just so many records to be listened to um, and kind of understand what the era was and what the, you know, the kind of the whole context of why these scores were made and the why they were made the way they were made and, and who the composers are. And so yeah, I, I spend quite a bit of time listening to that stuff. But yeah, I don't know. I, how about you guys? Like, I, f- I feel like it's sort of like the older I get, my threshold just continues to get higher for 
anything to impact me, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> which is pretty sad, really. I tend to, when that happens, I mean, just like the last week or so, I took a trip from like Kansas City to Omaha and hit some record stores along the way. And, and that's what I did is I just, I, I bought nostalgic records. I think I got a copy of like a Alice's Restaurant, uh, Arlo Guthrie, like uh, right. the soundtrack from that record. I got some uh, Herb Albert and uh, Tijuana Brass. <laughs> and some cars <laughs> and stuff like that there you go <laughs> but yeah it just i take a break i take a break and i go back and appreciate what you're supposed to do yeah you know it's funny both my kids you know i have a 13 year old and a 19 year old they're both girls and they suddenly now want turntables right mm-hmm. it's a thing and so uh-huh. our 13 year old got a turntable for her birthday and i you know went to the the record store and like dug through all the $25 records for the $4 records. Right. And it was great. I, you know, Eurythmics and Ultravox were like two of the records I pulled out. Oh, nice. I got a Eurythmics uh, single. Yeah. That first record, that song particularly yeah. is really, really good. Yeah, it is. And it's not something, you know, back in the day I would have, I would have been like, oh yeah, yeah, that's good. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't have like dug into it mentally, you know, cause I would have been like, it's right. not tough, tough enough or, you know, not rock right. enough or right. whatever. <laughs> um, and so it's, I don't know. It, I, it's not a bad, bad idea. If, in fact, just going to the record store and digging. I just did just get the gang of four box set. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Which is pretty epic actually, you know, but oh, that's like a, that's a no brainer. Like I've right. loved gang of four from the second I heard them and have always been a big fan. And so let's see what else. Uh, Do you have any like current composers that you're into? Um, I, Like I, Tyler Bates is popping into my head right now. I really like him. Yeah. He's got, yeah, he's got a night. I mean, he's super talented for one thing. Oh, he's amazing. You know, and he's got kind of a cool, tough feel sometimes. Uh, It, it seems like, like not a very original concept, but a lot of Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross recently uh, has been really, really, really good. Yeah. You know, the, the whole Watchmen score is incredible. Yes. I just thought it was genius and can't even figure out how they did some of it, to be totally honest. And, you know, kind of, wow. it's like, you know, one of those craft things too. It's like, Ooh, I kind of want to do that trick, but fuck, how'd they do that? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just really good music overall. Let me think. What else? I, you know, I've been listening to podcasts that kind of analyze Mm. music and, and, you know, scores particularly. And for better or worse, like Alan Silvestri, you know, he's become really famous for all the Marvel scores, Mm -hmm. but you know, he goes way like the abyss is, I think the first time he showed up on my radar back in, you know, the eighties, whenever that film came out early nineties, eighties, I think it's eighties, but uh, yeah, it's just, kind of going back and going, oh, right, I see where that now seems cliche, (sighs) giant film score technique. Mm -hmm. But if you go back, it's like, oh, right, it comes from, you know, this this one guy who kind of explored these things and then other people kind of chimed in and kind of stole from it and then he stole it back and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, of course, Danny Elfman, you know, yeah, kind of he's fascinating to me. the pot up. I know he's pretty neat. Right. Like as a person, mm-hmm. you know, he used to go with Kim Gordon way back when. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. In high school, I guess. Huh? Yeah. I can't, I don't know. For some reason I'm kind of, you know, Spotify has really fucked up my ability to know <laughs> what, the, what the fuck I'm listening What's to. Going we on? have yeah. this conversation pretty routinely. Like it's such a love hate relationship for me. It is. <sighs> I like, I hate that it really is not fair to artists, yeah. but I also love that, like, it is actually pretty decent at finding stuff that I'll be like, Ooh, what's this? Right. Yeah. The rate, the quote unquote radios are actually pretty good. You know, like, yeah. you know, you put on a Tom Waits radio, like it does eventually converge on, you know, something that's familiar from some other quote unquote radio. Yeah. But, um, it's, often does does you right you know if you pick the the artist to start from and then sort of go from there oh yeah it's turned me on to so many artists lately and it's almost like i can't keep up with them (laughs) sometimes i have to like take a break okay spotify we got to take a little break (laughs) Uh, not that i don't appreciate (laughs) you but i gotta digest all this other shit you've given me yeah you know it's funny spotify for me has done two things one is like I do a lot of the nostalgia stuff too. Like I'm rediscovering, you know, for the umpteenth time stereo lab, 
you know? And, yeah, uh, yeah. and so yeah. it's just so easy to kind of put it on a giant, you know, random selection. And, you know, instead of listening to a whole record, just kind of listen to the whole of stereo lab. And it's just really been nice to rehear it through kind of older ears, I guess, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I always loved them and we were friends with them, mm-hmm. you know, there's that, but the other thing I'm discovering is, uh, do you guys, have you watched Shameless? Uh, I've watched some of it. Yeah, uh, I've yeah. seen like an episode. I don't know what it is. Yeah, with like William H Macy and yeah, yeah, the American one, right? And it's yeah set in Chicago. I won't go into the the ins and outs of of why I think that show is kind of amazing. But the thing that I do love is it has tons of like kind of modern garage rock or garage punk, mm. um, and uh, and it's used really well in the show. But it you know, has given me this thing of like, I go find all these bands that show up on that show. I did the same thing with true romance. Um, not true romance. Wait, no, what, what am I trying to say? True blood. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. The vampire show. Wait, hold on. <laughs> true detective. True detective. Oh my God. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was a good, that was a good I series. I just great. went like Hans great. Zimmer, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, like vampire porn. And then, yeah. Um, yeah true detective. True uh, detective. Was, yeah. yeah. Like black angels. But yeah, it's great. Cause, but I, unfortunately now, like my brain is old and dried out. So, you know, I discovered these new bands. I'm like, oh, they're amazing. And then I can't, yep. then I forget immediately who the fuck they were. I and, know what my right. trick is. I just do the little heart thing. That's the biggest thing that I can do. Oh, okay. If I can reach the phone and just click heart, I like that one. Then I can go back and go, okay, who was this? Oh, right. yeah. That's a good idea. Mm-hmm. I guess the other technology is there. And then it'll make you like a playlist of all that shit. Right. And like a new radio. <laughs> Right. Yeah, it's got me on, and I've talked about the like a uh, Irish post punk kick. Right. Lately, there's some really good shit coming out of there. Yeah, Montaigne's. Yeah, good stuff. That's great. I mean, that's the thing. I talk about lack of foresight. Like somehow, you know, around '98 when house music was taken over and raves were all the thing. Mm-hmm. Like I just thought rock was dead basically. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that it's not. No, and it's amazing that like you know, there's whole mountains of young bands that are still doing it with as much excitement as we did or you know the bands that they you know are influenced by did and i just think it's kind of awesome you know um so i i kind of discover a lot of that stuff but like i said i just don't know what any of it's called because a i can't remember and and b i it's not like in the old days you would know because that was the only you go to the record store and flip through the records or you'd know you're going to buy a specific record and now it's just too easy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We've had entire episodes where we talked about the challenges of finding music, you know, in the eighties. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Especially growing up in like rural small town. Oh yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Montana would have been uh, probably similar to Missouri, right? Yeah. I bet it was. Yeah. Yeah. Your hairstyle actually mattered, you know, like, cause (laughs) you'd be like, Oh, there's somebody with the same hairstyle or like the same, jacket or whatever you know it's kind of sensibility and so you could go hey what music are you listening to and they'd be like <laughs> right. oh, the stranglers or whatever and be like oh my god <laughs> when i was growing up like seriously acdc was as hard as it got you know in my little town people would like bring in their smuggled acdc tapes right and you'd listen to that or def leppard or whatever it was and now yeah now it's just to click away anything you want and it'll blow you away yeah, yeah. yeah. Anything. I know. Yeah. Mont- Montana, we were pretty lucky. I guess skateboarding was our ticket to other music, you know? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. And we had a, we had a call, you know, it's a university town. So there was college kids too, that would bring, you know, smuggling <laughs> music that wasn't ACDC or. Yeah. yeah. In college that way, I remember people bringing in like the, you know, nine inch nails tapes and all. Oh my gosh. Who are these guys? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Getting introduced to bands like ministry and, and whatnot. I, I tell you what else is cool. Uh, a thing I found, but I mean, you're never going to remember who any of these people are, but if you go to radio garden, uh-huh. they're not a sponsor or anything, but no. <laughs> It's like a Google Earth, but it has all the radio stations like all around the world and like wherever they're playing in any given country, county, anything if they're like on a certain bandwidth. And there's just, I mean, thousands of them. You can just click on like random countries and see what like they're listening to and like the Southern Irish coast. Oh, cool. They're like, you know, in Lagos or wherever. 
you just kind of zoom around the whole and you just click on a radio station. It's it's really cool and it's free. I think Radio Garden. That's great. Radio Garden. Yeah. I mean, that's I should get back. You know, give a big shout out to um, our local uh, college station, Calex, because um, it's you know classic old punk rock. You know, the full eclectic college radio experience, and it does regularly turn me on to new things that I hadn't heard, you know, that I'm pretty psyched to to hear. But then you got to sit there and wait yeah, and go like, okay, that was song number three out of seven. Yeah. And are they going to say <laughs> which they are? You know? <laughs> right. Oh, I hate that when they don't tell you who it is. Like, oh my oh. God, this song was amazing. Right. I know. <laughs> I'll call yeah. them. Say who? Really? Hey, yeah. 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 They played that last track. Yeah. Now my kids will be like, hey, dad, just ask Siri, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Oh. oh, yeah, man. I use Shazam all the time. I, yeah. I can't get that thing to work for me for anything. Well, it, whenever I'm like humming or whistling. Yeah, it's not good at that. No. Mm. Well, and a lot of the stuff I like is pretty, but it does pick up pretty weird shit, you know? Like it can be pretty obscure and still it'll figure out what it is, which I find really remarkable. Yeah. John and I used to play a game. What was it with, was it with Pandora? I was trying to stump it. Kids tried to stump it, like throwing in like the most obscure bands we could think of that we actually knew. <laughs> yeah. And knew the title yeah. of the album and everything else. Yeah. And then try to stump it. Well, you know, that's a, that's probably the biggest downside to Spotify. I mean, other than the fact that they just fuck the artists over. I mean, they really just went out and got in bed with the biggest labels they could yeah. and don't manage if they even just manage the way they pay people in a more you know transparent sort of up upright way right it would be one thing yeah one of our friends i know just posted a one cent check that they got in the mail (laughs) (laughs) it's so just not oh i know what i was gonna say is do you remember there was a thing for a while while called all of mp3.com I think so. It was a Russian site. And w- what they did is they were selling MP3s and, and they were paying royalties. So it was quote unquote legal, right. but the royalties they were paying is for every MP3 they sold, they were paying like a performance royalty. Huh. So it was like a single stream, right? That, that was their way of, and they only shut down because I think the major credit card companies basically, you know, ostracized them into oblivion. Uh. But the amazing thing was, is because it they didn't require an agreement with any of the labels. And I know this is super fucked for everybody really involved. But the one great thing about it was, is that because it didn't require agreements, they had everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> they had like super obscure, avant-garde, classical, you name it. Just yeah. super out there shit. And it was kind of amazing, you know, for a, a brief period of time before then it was like, of course, you can't can't do that because it's you know, I have uh, just an old desktop that has been gathering dust in my attic and I only keep it because I it still has a hard drive from the Napster days. Not that I ever <laughs> did anything wrong uh, or illegal, but I they I had a bunch of shit that you can't find anywhere on there. Yeah. So I, I live in hope of saving that hard drive someday. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, I have, I have a big raid array because, you know, I at work in the business and I work from home a lot. So I have a huge, many, many, many terabyte system for backing shit up. <clears throat> and on there is my collection of MP3s <laughs> from moving from studio to studio. Right. So, oh, yeah. you know, all those years working at these animation studios and film studios and whatnot, Every studio I worked at had some major like central repository where everybody would put their MP3s and then you could just copy them, you know, and so I collected up this huge collection of digital, you know, copies of just pretty out there, obscure electronica and noise music and rock. Uh-huh. You know, and standard shit too. Way too much Grateful Dead, which I just, is, <laughs> it's like the one, the one band that I just will never find uh, interest in. No, I am right there with you. I do not understand the dead. And I've had people try and explain it to We've had episodes where people tried to explain. Yes. <laughs> we have. And I'm just like, can't do it. Yeah. I can't do it. I, okay. I appreciate that they are talented people. Never will be into the dead. It just, I don't know. It's, it sounds like bad acid feels, you know, and that's not a good thing. It's, 
<laughs> what an awesome description. <laughs> There's just nothing good about that. Um, uh, and so I've got this, you know, this giant thing of MP3s, and it's. I agree with you. It's like the weirdest thing. Like every now and again, I have a Sonos, and it is hooked into this thing, so I can play, you know, music from it. But it rarely, I rarely get there unless. I'm looking for something. It's like, oh, it's not on Spotify. It's not on Pandora. Huh? It's like, oh, look, it's in my collection. <laughs> but I also had a big house fire. Oh, shit. All of my CDs, the cases all like were di- like melted uh, and damaged by smoke. <sighs> but the CDs themselves are fine. So, huh? I mean, you know, for the most part, they're fine. And I managed to rip, you know, it's like a thousand CDs or something. <sighs> and I, just, I managed to rip, you know, a third of them. I still have like eight boxes of CDs with no cases yeah. that are, are meant to be rinsed and, and ripped. <laughs> ah, I had like a, a 300 CD like case, one of those big zip up like suitcase things in my car. It got ripped off. Oh, and, you know, at $10 a CD. Yeah. <laughs> you're talking like a three grand loss. God, you know, and you made it really convenient for them. Sure. <laughs> it's just like, Here's a handle. <laughs> yeah, I found them all in like a pawn shop next week. Of course, yeah. Like Matt said, we live in this, you know, a, a little bit neck town, and it's like, yeah, I really doubt anybody else had like uh, you fat bastards, <laughs> you know, from the UK, an import. Yeah. When nobody in this town knows who Faith and War is. Uh, uh, and there was. My, well, we don't know where it came from. It's like, yeah, I bet you don't. Yeah. I've had two guitars stolen over the years, which is, you know, uh, such a such a bummer. But, you know, it's one of those very pawnable items. Oh, sure. Yeah. You're around basically high risk groups, methamphetamines. And <laughs> yeah, I was a mobile DJ. I had my DJ gear stolen once and <laughs> that was pretty awful. Yeah, it's kind of it's an invasive sensation for sure. Mm-hmm. It really is. This is funny, though. Like the worst thing from that was I had like this old pair of shoes. They were like these vans that I, they were just broken in and nasty, <laughs> but I loved them. Mm-hmm. And they took my shoes and that. I took more personally than the room. Like I, I get the other shit. Yeah, but yeah. my shoes, get man. Your shoes. Leave my shoes. Yeah. Like, what are you gonna do wearing my five-year-old crusty Vans? <laughs> yep. And it just, and then you're just like, ah, oh, I'm just like imagining some asshole who does not deserve those shoes walking around in my well-worn, broken-in shoes. Yeah. I totally get it. I wonder where those guitars are sometimes, you know, <sighs> uh, luckily I, the first one, I mean, you know, it's like, it's that, what the first time shame on me, right. you know, or first time shame on you for second time shame on me kind of thing. Right. Yeah. You know, just too much, too many drug users around. Right. That's just one of those things. So probably live in like this, like red violin kind of life. Right. Well, that's what I hope. You know, my my oldest is a violin player. See, there you go. Mm. And, you know, that's just such a cool idea that the violin, you know, has the player, not the other way around, you know? Yeah. And I like that. So hopefully someone's enjoying both of those strats. Uh. But I still have the better one. Like, so yeah. at least there's that. At least I ended up with the, the blue one that I'd always played. So. Oh, around. Yeah. Is a strat your go-to? Um, yeah, it has been just because I can... I can get most of the tones out of them that I need to. Mm. Um, I mean, I have, I have other guitars, you know, my other big go-to is, uh, is an SG. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. I have a really nice SG special that I got from Gibson for the brief period. I was um, endorsed by them, but it was a pretty good score because it's like black and uh, it's just such a nice guitar. Oh, sweet. You know, for that ACDC sound. Yeah. Right. But uh, I'm one of those simple people, like I get a skateboard and I ride it until it just, it's like, I like the broken in shoe, you know, Yeah. I'm going to keep the comfortable thing as long as possible. Cool. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. You have any upcoming projects or, you know, new itches that you're needing to scratch? Yeah. Irons in the fire. Or just... Um, you know, there's a bunch of things going on, but most of them are work. Yeah. And so I can't really talk about them. Right. You know, just because they haven't been announced. Um, we did just ship something. So, um, it's kind of the worst period for that. Sure. It's all kind of far out there and nothing that I can really talk about. I am hoping to make my own record at some point. 
Mm. I just set aside enough time that I can get that machine in my brain spinning again. And, and there's some ideas that I want to try. You know, it's funny, I, you know, there's lots of years where I wasn't releasing records before I ever released a record. And then after as well. And I just have boxes of cassettes of shit that I've made just because I am planning to make something doesn't mean it'll necessarily see the light of day. either. <laughs> right. I'm pretty perfectly happy usually having things just sit in my closet that I made. Um, though there is, you know, the very first, not the very, very first, but the, I'd say the second steel pull bat, the cassette that we released is being re-released on heavy vinyl by um, no coast. Oh. And so That'll be cool. Like I thought it was really neat that they reached out. Um, we're fans of them and that festival and sort of that underground DIY scene. Yeah. And so I'm doing kind of a remaster on it, which has been really fun. I need to get back to it. I kind of had to stop because I, I don't know if you can hear like I'm in um, my new studio uh -huh. in the basement of our house, which I've been working on for like four or five years, but I finally finished it during COVID, but it's not treated. So I oh, yeah, finished yeah. mastering this, this cassette, but it's, it's, it's pretty fun. It, yeah. You know, it's, it's just the three of us. And it's when we finally kind of made the turn towards what became really the steel pull bathtub that everybody knows. Well, everybody who knows steel pull bathtub, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and it's pretty amazing considering it was probably a f done on a four track cassette with probably four microphones. Yeah, it actually sounds pretty good. So that's kind of cool. It's crazy. Yeah, I had this. I went down this little journey recently. My dad was a singer songwriter, more of like a folky country sort of thing, and he died in like '83. And just recently, I dug up a bunch of his old cassettes, and just even with a laptop and a little mixer, I was surprised at how decent of a edit I could get out of it, and how much I could improve the sound as opposed to just what was on the cassette. Oh yeah, yeah. So I'd imagine. Imagine working with some real better quality equipment than I have. Uh, you could do some pretty amazing things. Yeah. And A, that's a really cool story, by the way. Like that must oh, just thank been you. like such a cool experience. It was, it was, uh, it was a trip for me. It's kind of emotional for sure. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. He was a great singer songwriter too. Yeah. yeah there's a bunch of his tracks up uh, on, on our website too. Yeah. I love the stuff. I'll send you a link. Yeah. I'd love to hear it. I, I'm such a huge, huge fan of the, you know, the literally unsung, you know, artists. Cause you know, now everybody's just so like me, 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 you know, which <laughs> right. I know like yeah. our, our generation was so kind of fucked up the opposite way. Like, Oh, you sell out, mm. like you making money from your art. That's not art, you know? Right. Um, which was a little ridiculous in the opposite direction, but uh, now it's just so over the top. Like, er like if you're not being heard, you don't exist, I guess. Yeah. But I kind of really am a big, like I said, I have, you know, boxes of cassettes of things that I do just for myself. And, you know, I, I really appreciate that sort of outsider art, you know, the person who, you know, everybody discovers had, has made like 400 paintings after they're dead that are particularly unique or whatever. Right. Yeah. Those are cool stories. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. But yeah, the technology now is pretty amazing. I have to say, especially for that kind of, you know, mastering and whatnot. I'm still a huge fan of the old way, you know, the Bob Weston. I don't know if you're familiar with Bob, but he's, you know, a colleague of Albini's and mm -hmm. he, he does, you know, vinyl mastering just in the, in really all the hardware and, and doing it the old way. And it really does sound incredible the way he does it. Yeah. And there is no, I don't think there's really digital equivalents of that. No. Nah. And, and there was something to the hands-on element yeah. uh, to me because I, I got into radio and DJing just right when everything was starting to make that transition. Like I was trained on turntables and reel-to-reel, -reel, so I knew how to do that stuff. And as they were evolving, it was like a weird adjustment. I almost felt like I was cheating a lot of the time when I did too much stuff digitally. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, well, in those early days, too, it was like the digital stuff actually did sound pretty terrible, too, you know? Yeah. Or it could, you know? And it was very clunky and confusing, and I got lost doing it. And I'm like, just give me a razor and a tape and some adhesive, <laughs> and I can make what I want out of it. Yeah, no, I, I boy, I've been through all that. And it's fun, funny, I, I teach sometimes at the San Francisco Conservatory, and I often teach mixing, like advanced mixing. 
mixing and do workshops and stuff. And, you know, everybody's like, oh, we need to work on the two inch, you know, tape. And, <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, there are reasons to do that, but there's also a lot of reasons not to do that too. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it's pretty easy to to do a whole session that you think sounds amazing and not get your calibration right. And then all of a sudden it doesn't sound so amazing anymore, you know? Right. I, I love all of it. I'm really glad that I got to, you know, go through both generations and, and, and appreciate the the modern tools too. You know, I think under certain circumstances, they're super, super useful. Oh yeah. Well, even like, I, I don't have a budget. I use audacity and it, once you get past the clunkiness, it's not a bad product. Yeah. Yeah, no, Audacity is great. It's, you know, I have all the budget in the world and I work on computers all day and that tool does things that other tools don't do. And so it's super useful and it, it really doesn't matter that it's free. I mean, it's kind of makes it even better that it's free. Right. You know? Yeah. Like I'll sit down with Logic and I, I you know, I've played around with it. And I'm, I get so confused. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't think you're totally alone on that. But yeah, I, I, I'm pretty good with the the computers, I guess. So it's funny though. the The truth is, is I'm good with computers, but when it comes to interfaces and you know, I don't know, like VCRs, and I guess we don't even use VCRs anymore. So that's, <laughs> that's dated. But uh, people can still make software that I don't get yeah. or, you know, find it, you know, just like everybody else. Cause at the end of the day, you're just pushing the buttons or the things that they expose to you. And so you're kind of at the behest of potentially a shitty designer really, you know? And so right. I think of that, it's like, you know, that the future coming AI overlords, right. And ooh, <laughs> how right. that could all go wrong. And mm -hmm. all I can think is, it's just going to be like, like such shitty AI. You know, where it's just like, oh, some <laughs> asshole didn't do a very good job designing the CAI. And like, for example, I remember I was, I was trying to buy a ticket in France. We were going to Europe for vacation and I was trying to buy this specific train ticket. Uh -huh. So I went in and I reserved four. you know, you could see how many were available and I reserved four, and then I went to pay for it. And for some reason, the credit card thing didn't go through, uh -huh. but the software on the other end marked them as sold. So there were four fewer, right? Mm. And that particular software was doing just-in-time pricing. So the price went up. And so then I tried again, credit card didn't work again. And so each time I did it, the price was going up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, no. the price <laughs> right? Yeah. And it was just one of those like, Fuck, you know, some asshole has a bug <laughs> in their software that's literally going to cost me a bunch of money mm -hmm. because, you know, they record the sale before it actually goes through. How hard is that? Like, come on. <laughs> and it, I, I could just see that being like the future of like, well, if you want to get your food coupons, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, you know, right. Yeah. This dystopian future we're headed for. Welcome to Costco. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Right. No, that is a scary thought or just like people that just know enough to be dangerous. Right. Exactly. But yeah, so we don't have to worry about with AI with like the really, really smart people that know what they're doing. It's the people that just kind of half-ass know what they're doing. Right. Yeah. Artificial stupidity, right? Like, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's where the monster robots are going to come from. <laughs> that's right. Yep. Yeah. I mean, just think of all the people, you know, who do shit work at their whatever, you know, mm -hmm. are, are doing their work to rip you off, you know, a car mechanic or a plumber or a, and I'm not saying like, I'm, you know, super hands on. I love doing carpentry and, and plumbing even. I'm just saying, you know, there are people out there who don't give a shit about doing a good job. And, <laughs> Absolutely. And when they're designing the software that is controlling your life. Right. Well, and they're, and they're overconfident. So they oversell themselves. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. they sound awesome. And then no, holy shit, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, but now I'm starting to sound like the grumpy old man. Like if you, <laughs> if you want it done right. <laughs> You've at least accepted that AI is coming. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a no-brainer. It's just going to be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I, I'm afraid that that is the, the probably going to be the, the big downside. Yeah. The upside will hopefully be that 
so it will actually take over and be like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you guys can lie to yourselves all you want, but <laughs> here's the shit we got to do to save the planet or, right. you know. Right. Um, well, there'll still be people revolting against that. Yeah. Probably. Because they won't like it. Of course. Our, our dystopian future. Yeah. Uh, it's looking bright. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a real pleasure talking to you guys. Yeah, you too, man. No, man, this is a blast. I really appreciate you coming on and seriously uh, keep in touch. We'd love to have you back on sometime or sure. hang out if you ever do make it to Missouri. Yeah, right. Uh, like I said, I have a list of places that I haven't been and so. I try to get to them. Yeah, we'll take you to the less scary places. Yeah, we'll give you the tour. <laughs> L- living in California, there's definitely a lot of us, you know, expats from small towns and yeah. kind of scary places. And I definitely know some people from Missouri here. Wow. Uh, nice. Yeah. Everybody, thanks for listening to the of the Podcast. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Uh, special guest, Mike Moraski. Yeah. Have a great week, everybody. Yeah.